This is Slow Food Live. Um, I am Felix. I am with Slow Food USA. So Slow Food is a Slow Food USA is a national organization that's part of an international organization fighting for good, clean food for all. Um, so we is a very big umbrella of a mission to make sure that the human right of food, good, the access to good food, is a thing for everyone. So we get to have many various and diverse conversations about about food, including this one, about Russian food, and especially the pink bellini, which I'm very excited to learn how to make. Um, with that said, we have our special guest, Sarah Goldstein here. It uh, comes from our uh, partnership with Ken Speed Press and Clarkson, Clarkson Potter uh, Publishing. Uh, Dara has just published a, a new cookbook on heritage Russian food uh, that speaks to, sounds like from the reviews that even the young Russians are loving reading this and connecting to old food ways they may, not have, they may have forgotten or not been connected to. Um, and Dara has a long and distinguished career uh, that not just food, but sounds like started in art and literature and is now focusing on food and the, and the combination of all these arts uh, with this newest cookbook, Beyond the North Wind, being the last, the most latest uh, iteration of that. Uh, her long career has uh, won her an award recently, we were just talking, from the IACP, the International Association of Culinary Professionals, has awarded uh, Dara the Lifetime Achievement Award. So we're really honored to have you, Dara, and uh, a lifetime of achievement we can maybe <laughs> tap into here. But without further ado, here's Dara Goldstein. Thank you so much, Felix, for that lovely introduction. Um, I was thrilled to get this award and then suddenly I was thinking, a lifetime already? It's a bit of a shocker. But anyway, I'm so glad to be here tonight to talk about things that I love, Russian food and Pink Blini in particular. Um, I wanna show you my book in case you haven't seen it with beautiful photography by Stefan Wettinen. And this book really is a journey, uh, a journey to the far north of Russia, beyond the Arctic Circle, to the coldest, most remote places. I've been thinking about Russia for over half my lifetime. And actually in 1983, I published my very first cookbook, which was a Russian cookbook that grew out of my interest in Russian literature. I had wanted to write my dissertation on food in Russian literature and was told there was not a serious topic. This was quite a long time ago. I think it's a lot easier for scholars these days. But I was determined to show how food really provides a window, an immediately accessible window into culture. And I wrote a lot, these were the Soviet days, the Cold War days. I wrote a lot rather nostalgically about the 19th century dishes of the aristocracy, the haute cuisine that was so highly influenced by the French. And I also wrote a lot about the foods from the different republics that then constituted the Soviet Union. So wonderful uh, pilafs, plof from Uzbekistan. Uh, chicken tabaka and everyone's Instagram darling now, Khachapuri from Republic of Georgia. But I don't think I paid enough attention to intrinsically Russian food. And in thinking about this food over a lifetime, I decided that I really want to get to what is most elemental about Russian food. And that's what took me to the remotest parts of the country where there hasn't been so much of an influence from the West. Now, I'm sure I can't see any faces here, so I can't see if you raise your hand or anything, but I'm sure that almost all of you are familiar with blini, or blini, I guess we would say in English. Uh, mostly we know them as elegant appetizers. If you go to a cocktail party, you're likely to get a really little pancake. Um, it's often kind of tough and dry, but in, if you're lucky, it might have a dollop of caviar on it. Uh, it might have some smoked salmon. 
Um, if you're unlucky, in my opinion, it will have maybe caviar, smoked salmon, uh, hard boiled eggs, onions, and all kinds of things just being loaded uh, with all kinds of conflicting flavors. But those aren't really what Russian blini are all about. So blini are the oldest of Russian foods. Uh, they were made even before Russia accepted Christianity in 988, over a thousand years ago. And they were made at the vernal equinox. So just at the end of the winter, when the sun was starting to come back into the sky. And you can imagine or try to imagine what winter, a long, long winter, especially in the north of Russia is like. Uh, it's pretty dark and it's awfully cold. And so baking these blini was a way to honor the return of the sun or if it hadn't quite returned, then at least to conjure its return. And the earliest ones were made by taking the batter and putting it right on a stone that had been heated in the fire. And in Russian, you say to bake blini. We make them on the stovetop now, but the traditional way to make them is actually in uh, the, the Russian stove, which is a, a masonry stove, like a, a wood burning pizza oven, except it's differently shaped. And in Russian villages today, they're still made that way. And I can talk about that a bit later in the uh, Q and A if you're interested in it. But uh, they turn out really big and beautiful with lacy edges. Um, Chekhov has this wonderful line in one of his stories about Blini as plump as the shoulders of a merchant's daughter, which I always liked. Um, that was considered a good attribute in those days. So the other thing about Blini, besides the fact that they're really about five to seven inches round, they're not these tiny miniature things, is that they are traditionally yeast raised. And this means that they get very light. They're plumper uh, than American pancakes. Um, they are also very airy and they're quite porous. And the pores that you see in them are really important because that means that they'll soak up a lot of butter, which is a good thing. Um, the flour that you use can be of several different kinds. So the oldest and most classic ones are made with buckwheat flour, uh, which is a good option for anyone who's gluten-free because buckwheat doesn't have gluten. There um, are old blini that were known as uh, krasne blini, which are uh, the word krasne, it's like a red square, but the old form of the word meant beautiful. So these were the fine blini that were made with wheat flour, which uh, was much more expensive than other kinds of flour because wheat wasn't easily grown in the Russian North. My favorite are a mixture of the two. So half buckwheat and half wheat. And you get that wonderfully nutty flavor from the buckwheat. And then you get the, the fineness from the wheat flour. Um, how do you serve these? Well, there is controversy about that too. And none other than uh, the great writer Nabokov uh, weighed in on this because in the writings of um, Nikolai Gogol, for instance, a, a great 19th century writer, in Dead Souls, he talks about the protagonist Chichikov, who, like most Russians, is obsessed with Blini. And uh, he takes three at a time, lavishes them with butter, and then rolls them up and dips them into butter and eats them that way. Other people like to have this beautiful pancake flat on the plate, put toppings on it, and then eat it that way as an open face pancake. Um, it's equally delicious, however you feel like doing it. So, so beloved are these pancakes that there is a, a festival in Russia called Masenitsa, which means butter festival. And it's somewhat equivalent to our Mardi Gras. So it's just before the long Lenten fast. But if Mardi Gras or the Shrovetide uh, festivities or Fastnacht 
in Austria. All of these mean that you eat really uh, rich foods. They're usually fried foods, donuts, often pancakes um, on this Fat Tuesday before you have to start tightening your belt. In Russia, the butter festival lasts for an entire week and you eat almost nothing but blini. And each day of the week had different iterations of how they were to be served. Um, because it's late February or early March when this occurs, it is after the marriage season. So usually the uh, young couple who had moved into the uh, son-in-law, the new son-in-law's cottage would invite the mother-in-law to come over to uh, show that they were giving hospitality and show the daughters uh, the new bride's prowess in making blini. And then the mother-in-law would invite them over to show that she had accepted the new couple and there were all of these rituals surrounding them. The blini I'm going to show you today are somewhat different. So the one kind that I haven't mentioned yet are the quick blini, which are, are very popular as you can imagine, because people, first of all, uh, there isn't an aristocracy that has lots of serfs uh, baking the blini in the oven that had to be fired for many hours before it was hot enough. Um, people are harried like they are here. And so you can make quick blini, which are a little bit closer to what we know as crepe by using uh, baking soda or um, other kinds of leaveners. Um, I don't usually make them. I mean, if I'm going to make blini, then for me, it's a production. But there is one kind of non-yeast raised blini that I really love. And these are pink blini. And I decided to include them in the book along with a traditional recipe because they were the beloved pancakes of none other than uh, Russia's great poet, Alexander Pushkin. And besides loving these pancakes and um, in the diary of one of his friends, uh, she wrote that he could eat 30 of them at one sitting. And he was not a particularly big or rotund guy. He also always kept a uh, jar of gooseberry jam on his desk and he would dip into it uh, for sustenance or for inspiration. So I decided to make these blini, which turn pink because you use beet juice, and then uh, make a compote of gooseberries, pink gooseberries and apples uh, that would beautifully complement the blini. And um, unfortunately, when I tested for the book, I had these gorgeous pink gooseberries. And if you can show a slide of the gooseberries, what they look like, you can see this wonderful rich color um, that they are, there they are. And so then you have these pink pancakes and you have a pink compote on top and you're just sort of pretty in pink and <laughs> you feel really happy. Um, this year, after I decided to uh, demo these for this presentation, I couldn't find pink uh, gooseberries anywhere. So I had to resort to green ones and that's what you're going to see. So Anna, if you could go into the demo video, which I recorded earlier so we could have natural light in the kitchen, then we'll take it from here. very favorite. I want to show you how to make some of my favorite Russian pancakes today called blini. You probably know them as little tiny uh, silver dollar sized pancakes that you get at cocktail receptions and you put some smoked salmon on. But the Russian blini are totally different. I'm making a special kind today and these are pink blini that use beet juice. They were said to be the great Russian poet Alexander Pushkin's very favorite pancakes, and he could eat tons of them at one time. I like to serve it with a compote that I make with apples and gooseberries. So we're going to get the compote started first because it needs to cool, and then we'll turn to the pancake mixing. So you take a pound of apples, 
and uh, you can use any apple that you like. I like them to be tart. I think that the tart and the sweet go really well in the Russian palate. Um, in my original recipe in the book, I call for fresh apples and fresh gooseberries. To my great sadness this year, my source of fresh pink gooseberries uh, is not available. I get them from Northwest Wild Foods, but they're out of stock. So I've had to turn to canned blueberries and therefore adjusted the recipe. So instead of adding three quarters of a cup of sugar to these apples, I'm just going to add a quarter cup because the gooseberries already have some sugar with them. And I'll drain these. And you can use the syrup for all kinds of other things. Put in some mixed drinks. Cocktails are always good. And just take a couple tablespoons of this syrup and throw it in here. Stir it up well. And then cook it for about 10 minutes over low heat. Um, when you're using fresh gooseberries, you would put them in at the same time with the apples so that they would cook but these, since these have already been processed, they're really soft. And if you add them with the apples, you're gonna end up with a mush. So uh, just keep that in mind. So we'll set this aside for now. Okay, these have been simmering for just about 10 minutes and they're nice and soft, but they still have a little bit of bite to them. A couple things I forgot to mention. Um, I often take half a vanilla bean and throw it in when I'm cooking the apples or the apples and gooseberries together. It gives it a really nice aromatic taste. It's not really necessary to do and I obviously forgot to do it this time but uh, you can throw it in, let it cool with the vanilla bean in it and then take that out before you serve. I also mentioned sour apples. You can use Granny Smith. You can use a sweet sour one like Honeycrisp. I have these beautiful apples that I just picked from our heirloom apple tree yesterday. I don't even know what kind they are, but uh, they're pretty wonderful and they have great texture. So that's what's gone into this compote. So I'm turning off the heat. Uh, take a look at the apples. You can see they're nicely softened. And all I'm going to do now is dump the drained can of gooseberries into the apples. And because they've been processed, they're soft. So you want to stir them in quite gently. Now, if you have pink gooseberries, it turns the most beautiful, beautiful shade of, of pink. And serving them on pink lini, you have pink on pink. And it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I'll turn this out into a bowl. And then what you want to do is just let this cool to room temperature, or you can chill it and it will stay, uh, it'll keep in the refrigerator easily for a week. And then just serve it on top of your blini, or you can serve it with meat is really nice or just have it as a snack. So there you are. That is your gooseberry apple compote. And now we're going to turn to the star of the show. These are the blini. So in Russia, blini are five or six inches in diameter. They're not these teeny mini ones that we get at American cocktail parties. And uh, it's one of the oldest dishes of all, made in pagan times, in fact. Uh, Russia accepted Christianity in 988, but before that they worshiped different gods. And one of the ways that they worshiped was to start making these pancakes, which they baked on hot stones in the time of the spring equinox, just as the sun was starting to get warm after a very long winter. And they would bake them in the image of the sun and there would be radiance, there would be light, and they would have the pancakes. So when Christianity took over, 
the Russian Orthodox Church recognized that this was a very important and I might add delicious ritual. And so it was folded into the Russian Orthodox Church calendar as a week long holiday before the long six week fast that is Lent. And where we might have Mardi Gras, which is Fact Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday, there are lots of uh, countries throughout the world that celebrate pancake days before Lent. Russia has an entire week called Maslenitsa, the butter festival, in which they serve blini in all different forms every day. So let's get to it. Um, I, this is a crepe pan I picked up, I don't know, maybe 50 years ago in France um, at a wonderful cookware store. It didn't cost very much, but it was a lot more expensive to try to get it home. It's very heavy cast iron and I've buttered it. One of the important things to remember is the Russian saying that um, the first blin that you make, the first pancake that you make is a lump. So never be distressed if the first one turns out misshapen or lumpy because you just have to get used to the process. So I have here, uh, the, you'll find the recipe on the website, but I have here uh, two cups of flour and uh, a teaspoon of salt. And now I have some egg yolks that I am going to just whisk. The traditional Russian blini are made with yeast and lots of sour cream and heavy cream, and they're allowed to rise for a long time and they're very light and porous. Um, Pushkin once compared uh, blini, some delicious blini he'd gotten, I'm sorry, Chekhov, once um, compared these delicious blini to the plump uh, shoulders of a merchant's daughter. And that's what you're aspiring to, are these plump pancakes. This kind is a little bit different. They are uh, quick cooking ones in that they don't use yeast. And they also, um, however, rely on some dairy. And in Russia, they would tend to use kefir. I happen to have uh, this wonderful buttermilk from a farm that's just a couple miles away, Gamma Garden, that has the same uh, sour tangy properties as kefir, so I use that, but either one would be okay. The thing that really distinguishes this is that I have added some beet juice, and that's what makes this, this gorgeous, gorgeous pink color. Um, it's just really, kind of neon and mind-blowing. And then you wanna add in some butter. Um, if I don't happen to have beet cross on hand, which I often do, you can buy a really good brand, Biota, uh, at most stores, even in my very small New England town, I can find it. And you can use that and it's really convenient. So, you take this liquid and whisk it into the flour. And initially you want to whisk it so that it's well incorporated so that you don't have lumps. You don't want to beat it, but um, on the other hand, you don't want a lumpy batter. So just get it well incorporated first. and then stir in the rest. And you can see you have this really nice, fairly loose batter. What you want to do now are take the egg yolks from your eggs and whip them until they're stiff but not dry. I always do this by hand. I feel like I have better control over it. And it goes faster, but obviously if you want to use a machine, you can. But they usually whip up within 
I don't know, less than a minute, they're already getting there with this can of me. There were different days when different people made blini during the Butter Festival. Um, it was just after the traditional time for marriages, and so mothers-in-law would invite their new daughters-in-law to have blini, and then daughters-in-law would have to invite the mothers-in-law to show their prowess in the kitchen. Things are a lot more relaxed these days in Russia. Okay, we're just about there. You want these to be stiff, but still pretty soft. Okay, so beautifully whipped, and just dump them in. And now you want to fold this in. You don't want to stir it because you want to keep the batter light. But make sure that you stir until it's all been incorporated. Unless, of course, you want marbled pink blini. I suppose you could leave some <laughs> patches in there. Yep, that looks pretty good to me. So now comes the moment of reckoning. I have um, put a little butter on this pan and my stove tends to run a little bit hot. So I have it medium low, but you'll understand your burner best. So what you want to do is pour maybe about a quarter cup of batter on and then immediately move it around until it gets thin. And you can play with the amount that you use. If you want to make them bigger, you want to make them smaller. As I said, that first one's always hard because you're never quite sure what the consistency is. And when you first butter the pan, it tends to be slippery. And so it doesn't really adhere quite as well. But uh, you can already see the beautiful bubbles are forming. The bubbles are the thing. Uh, first of all, it shows that it's cooking through, but you also um, end up with these wonderfully porous pancakes that are great for soaking up butter. I keep mentioning butter, but that's the whole point of the butter festival. So you let this cook for a couple of minutes until the um, pores or these bubbles have appeared everywhere. You'll find that the edges, which are thinner, are going to get lacy. Uh, sometimes it's more lacy than this, and that's a really beautiful thing. Now, if you're making these for a crowd, obviously, if you only have one pan, someone's gonna be standing at the stove doing all the work, but you can preheat the oven to 175, just really low, and have a, a platter in there that's oven proof. And as the blini are done, then you can just pile them on the platter until you have a big stack and they'll still be warm and you can serve them. So this one looks ready to turn, and it is. And you can see that it's nicely browned. You don't see the browning perhaps as much when it's a pink blini as when it's the other kind. But um, then on this side, you just want to cook it for a minute. Uh, there's so many different kinds of blini. I mentioned the classic ones that use yeast. And the flour that is really traditional to use in those pancakes is buckwheat flour, which I might add is gluten-free, so that's a bonus for some people. Um, there's another kind that in Russian is called krasne, which means beautiful. And these use fine or fine uh, white flour, so they were more expensive. My own favorite happens to be a mix of buckwheat and white flour, wheat flour, and that seems to be the perfect balance between flavor and texture. You can also make really quick ones with, uh, as I mentioned, 
baking soda, baking powder, and a lot of people do that too, but those turn out a little bit more like crepes. Okay. So already this one is moving around much more nicely in the pan than the first one. First one I wouldn't quite call lump, but this is actually a beautiful bean. And also the pan's a bit hotter, so it's cooking more quickly. And that also helps it um, retain its nice shape. I, as I mentioned, like to serve it with this compote and I put sour cream on top. But you could also serve these with uh, smoked fish. I think uh, smoked white fish would be really nice. Or maybe if you're a herring lovers, you could try that. You could try any other sorts of combinations. I probably would not do maple syrup on these. But this to me looks like an absolutely perfect pink bean, bean being the singular of bini. Um, there are lots of uh, street kiosks in Russia where you can go around and just order blini because they are so very popular. So this one, as you can see, is cooking more quickly than the last, and it is already ready to flip. And there you go. So just keep doing this over and over until you have as many blini as you want, and then serve and enjoy. Wow, I am very, very appetized, very hungry after that video. Um, I love that golden color. That, that 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 like crust that seems to form I can almost feel it in my mouth that like crispy texture uh so wonderful um I also love what you said about the Russians who are that Russian saying like don't worry about the first pancake uh I, I love that in many ways I feel like I can say that in many different aspects of my life <laughs> don't worry yeah. about the first one <laughs> exactly it, it it sounds much more evocative than if at first you don't succeed try try again <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh, so good. So um, there's a lot of praise and yummy notes in the chat, but we also have some questions that came out uh, from some folks. So one that's Blini related is that Nicole was asking, uh, uh, she didn't re actually remember this being a yeast rise, and she was wondering then, could this happen? Could could you make a blini or blini with a sourdough rise or anything else? You had mentioned baking soda and other things. Oh, you know, um, the traditional Russian bread is sourdough, and it it, it is a rye loaf. But blini are a different category. It's not that you couldn't make it with sourdough, but it's considered something um, distinctive. And so it's usually made with uh, fresh ingredients. Uh, the thing about blini is it's about dairy. So the uh, most excessive blini have, besides eggs, uh, the egg yolks and the egg whites that you whip, they also have heavy cream. Um, sometimes in addition, they'll have milk and sour cream. And so all of that dairy, which is about to be forbidden during Lent, is really what the purpose of the blini is. But yeah, you could certainly experiment with sourdough if you wanted to do that. Oh, great. And I think part of her question was, if we did sourdough, it sounds like it's probably a good idea to let it rise for a second as a batter uh, versus going for it right away, possibly. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. So when you have a yeast batter for the traditional blini, and you can check the recipe in my book, because the first one that I show is for the, the classic ones, uh, you can let it rise for anywhere from one to three hours. It's pretty forgiving. Um, let me see if I can hold up a, a picture for you. Yeah, if you can, oops, are you seeing that? Yeah, we'll, we'll Okay, so these, these are the classic blini. And to get a sense of the size, um, this is one of my favorite photographs in the book. Oops, <laughs> this is so awkward. The book's very heavy. But do you see this little boy? Oh, holding yeah, up wonderful. the pancake? 
steaming. Yeah, it was yeah. wonderful. Uh, great, thank you so much. Uh, we had another question for JR about, uh, he's, the question is actually asking, how do you say pink blini in Russian? But I'm guessing is blini, blini is the Russian word, is it not? Yeah, so one pancake is a blin. Um, several pancakes are blini. Pink is uh, several pink pancakes. <laughs> Rosa Ah, perfect. Okay. Perfect. And the, it's just uh, pancake. So there's no well, Russian no, word for pancake. No, these are blini. So okay. uh, I'll go into, uh, you know, my professorial mode now. Um, actually, <laughs> like, where, do, where does the name, uh, where does the word blini come from? Well, um, it actually comes from the original form of the word was mlini. And you find that in some of the South Slavic languages. And that is related to a verb malot, which means to grind. So these are things that have, uh, in which you've taken the grain, you know, buckwheat or flour, uh, wheat flour, and uh, wheat, sorry, the whole grain, and you grind it and you get mlini, which then became blini. And uh, they are considered distinct from other Russian pancakes, which are, for instance, aladzi. So aladzi are more like American pancakes. They're often made with all kinds. I mean, you can add fillings to blini, just uh, you know, have some scallions or some onions or a bit of ham or whatever you want. Um, but the other pancakes are puffier. They're always quick. They're not made with yeast. Uh, you can make them with grated squ summer squash with, with uh, they don't use so much zucchini, but summer squash with, uh, there's a recipe for pumpkin pancakes in this book. Uh, so they're blini a category unto themselves. Now you can take the, uh, the thin ones, the quick ones, and um, you can spread a filling like farmer's cheese on them and, uh, or you can spread jam on them and roll them up into uh, envelopes and serve them with tea, or else you can roll them into tubes and fry them, pan fry them, and those become blintzes. I mean, they're still called blinchiki in Russian, but it's the same as blintzes in the Russian Jewish tradition. You can even take these pancakes and layer them with uh, cooked ground beef or again with farmer's cheese, put um, each pancake and its layer into a, uh, like a souffle dish. And then you can have a blinchati pirok, which is a blini pie. So there are all kinds of things you can do with these pancakes. Sounds so wonderful. Uh, so would you consider then blini a more savory type of dish, usually re represented in savory terms, or is it not so binary? Does it kind of straddle the line? You know, it's such a good question. I would say that um, in general, blini are the perfect vehicle for uh, salty, savory, you know, caviar, smoked fish, herring, things like that. But um, they're absolutely appropriate to serve with jam for tea. And uh, these kiosks, these uh, street stands that you find throughout Russia make really huge blini the way you might see crepes being made in, in France, for instance, you know, they have that sort of scraper that goes around and you have a list of maybe 30 different fillings that you can get. And for those, you know, some are really wacky and the sky's the limit. Wow, I did. I did note that in your video you uh you did caution us to you not use maple syrup was there a reason for that is that a soggy factor or something um you know that's so interesting i love maple syrup and i live in a maple syrup producing place and in fact we've made our own in the past but um some if i were going to put a syrup on blini and I usually don't have them sweet, but if I were going to, then I would get uh, birch syrup. 
which they make in Canada. And it has, it's a little less sweet than maple syrup. It's a lot darker. I'm sorry, I'm so far from the kitchen or I would go and <laughs> grab it, but it's the other end of the house. So that would take too long. But uh, look for birch syrup or um, some people just um, across the line are making some in uh, Vermont are making some hickory syrup. And that's also somehow more savory. So I would play with different syrups. There's nothing that's wrong with it, but somehow for me, the maple syrup goes with my husband's really delicious American pancakes. I, you're making me, I, I used to live in Vermont and, and New York and I, the hickory syrup and birch syrup and like oh. even that dark grade B Vermont maple syrup, you're making yeah. me miss, you're making yeah. me miss the Northeast quite a bit, but oh. maybe soon. Um, uh, we have a couple questions about gooseberries, but we did have another question about the blini itself. Uh, Joanne has mentioned that uh, you talked about beet kvass in the recipe. Uh, do you think you have to adjust for salt if you're using kvass, because kvass could be quite salty? Well, you know, the kvass that I make doesn't have any salt in it at all. I just take beets, um, peel them, and put them in water and let them ferment for a couple of weeks. And that is my class. I know a lot of people do add salt. So um, depending on the class that you're using, or if you have a commercial one that adds salt, then you might want to adjust your batter. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we had, Cecilia did ask about baking powder and baking soda, which you said, I think, in the video that that's a, a way to go, but it may have a different result. Yeah, it does. I mean, I don't really make that kind of blini because to me, they're not really <laughs> the emotional experience of eating the other ones. But um, if you're using something like buttermilk or kefir or sour cream, then you're going to want to use some baking soda just because you want a little bit of, of leavening for lightness. Um, in these, the beet ones, you don't have yeast and you don't have baking soda, but uh, you have the egg whites um, that uh, provide that bit of lightness to them. But they're not, as you saw, they're not as puffy as, say, the other uh, blini that you might be trying to achieve if you're using leavening. Right. So careful to make sure you keep that puff and that lightness, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, Heidi is asking, saying that in her experience in Austria, uh, they have thin pancakes that can be sliced thin and used as noodles for chicken or vegetable soup. Is this also the case in Russia? You know, it's not something that um, is part of the standard Russian repertoire, um, but I think you could very successfully do it, especially the ones that are made with buckwheat flour you know, that have that really nutty flavor, I think they'd be quite delicious. So yeah, definitely experiment. Awesome, so versatile. Uh, we have a couple of questions about uh, the berries and the compo. Uh, so one question is, I guess this is a very, this is a local question. Uh, where do you typically get the gooseberries if they're not from the can as you've shown? Do you have any recommendations on sourcing? Yeah, it's a little hard. So in the summertime, we have some gooseberry bushes um, here in uh, Western Massachusetts. And I actually have some pink ones that I grow and also some green ones. Um, they're not wild, they're a cultivated berry and they grow really well in this part of the world, but it's always a battle with the birds. And usually, you know, I'm waiting for just that perfect moment of ripeness. And even if I've spread some kind of netting over it, um, the birds usually win. But um, I found that an excellent source for the gooseberries is a company called Northwest Wild Foods. And you can mail order from them. And they always seem to have the green gooseberries, which uh, are, it's the flavor is pretty much the same. It's just the aesthetics are not quite as um, lovely because, uh, you know, a green, a pale green just doesn't uh, match a vibrant pink. But they okay. also sell uh, wonderful black currants, which are really important in Russian mm -hmm. cooking. And my favorite, my 
obsession, um, see buckthorn berries. So oh, you, yeah, those uh, are yeah. delicious and tart. Yeah. yeah, really wonderful. Amazing. Uh, so that we had a question about flavor then. So would you say that gooseberry flavors uh, vary quite a bit? One specific question was like, is the pink gooseberry going to taste different from the sweet tart cape gooseberry? Or is it fairly similar? Oh, these aren't cape gooseberries. That's a whole different plant. Okay. I don't know what the um, Latin name is. Maybe someone who um, is on the chat knows. Uh, those cape gooseberries have a like a little husk on them and they're uh, yellow and they're uh, firm. And gooseberries, uh, gooseberry gooseberries, <laughs> for lack of a, a better term, are uh, like fresh berries. You know, fresh oh, okay. berries. So they're and possibly very different in taste. This is a very different plant. Uh, completely different, yeah. Because the Cape gooseberries, I don't even know that they grow in Russia. Yeah, so look for, they're just called gooseberries. You'll find them, you find them a lot in uh, English cooking. Their gooseberry fool is one of the beloved desserts there. Just gooseberries mm. that are pureed and, um, folded with whipped cream. It's really amazing. But so they have a, 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 a very soft, I mean, uh, fresh gooseberries you need to simmer and simmer with some sugar uh, and they're quite tart. So depending how tart you like your food, that's how much sugar you add. It makes a really lovely jam. But mm. um, you would mix that uh, and then put them through a food mill and then you get a puree that you can do any number of things with. That sounds wonderful. I feel like tart, tart and bitter are flavors I don't get enough. And oh. it sounds like one of those wonderful chances. Uh, Catherine, it's kind of switch, switching gears to another of the vegetables. She's asking if you're using beets, like actual whole beets. Um, do you have any tricks about how to make that beet juice? Yeah, I mean, if you have a, a powerful juicer, um, peel the beets and put them through a juicer and you'll end up with beet juice. Oh, perfect. Get yeah. a juicer. Uh, is it recommended to do by hand if we don't have a juicer or is it, is it quite the ordeal? Um, I mean, I think beets are really hard to get beet juice from. Yeah. 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 A, a juicer is a good investment. Or you, yeah. you did uh, you did show us a, uh, a great uh, supplier in your video. Uh, did you not? Uh, oh, a supplier of beet juice. juice. Yeah, I really, I mean, I love to make things by hand. And uh, many of the recipes in the book are based on, you know, starting from absolute scratch and showing how the Russians have done it from time immemorial, because that's part of the whole interest that these, practices have survived for well over a thousand years but the reality of life is that you don't necessarily have um, these things to hand and if you can get a really good quality uh, commercial product that is organic and and good I think it's fine to use it great yeah or like me if I have a tiny little kitchen I might have I might have to make some sacrifices to get my my bleeding. <laughs> yeah. uh, along those lines, I think Laura Lori here is trying seeing how uh, testing your limits. She says, <laughs> "Would your heart ever let you drop a bit of red food coloring in the compote to get the color you want, or would that just be too far afield for you?" <laughs> well, you know, I w there's no need to do it because, um, okay, say you didn't have any say you had beets, some beets, raw beets, mm -hmm. <laughs> but no beet juice. Um, you could roast the beets and uh, or even boil the beets just to, you know, make beets for dinner in some form or another. And you know, if you've ever worked with the beets, your hands get completely red. So if you roast the beets, um, there is some juice that comes out and it's all red. So take a teaspoonful of that and add it to the batter. Um, Got it. 
it beets are a, a, a food color, a natural food coloring. So we have many options here before we have to uh, go all the way to the artificial. It sounds yeah, like. or you could add, um, I mean, the flavor profile would be completely different, but if you have some raspberry puree, you know, then it right. wouldn't be beet pancakes, but you could add some raspberry to it and that would turn red. Yeah, that would feel much better eating that than maybe some artificial color. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, oh, Lori, Lori, Lori is uh, clarifying that she was actually talking about the compote color, not the blini, but oh, sounds like it applies. Even, oh, I actually thought about that, Lori. I thought, should I just do it? But no. <laughs> and right. I guess actually it would be very delicious to add some raspberry juice to that. It would be super oh, delicious. There you go. Because then you'd have a layering of flavors. So you'd have the apple and the gooseberry and the raspberry. And I think I might try that next time I make it. Uh, yeah. There we go. That, that's an experiment, it sounds like. Sounds delicious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, James is saying that he has no juicer, uh, no access to kvass. So how about a little bottle crack of speed, borscht essentially concentrate that he can find widely in the Polish stores near him? Uh, do you, would you think that's a, a route he should go? Um, oh, you mean like the, the clear Manischewitz borscht that is sold? I'm not sure. Uh, he says Krakus beet borscht concentrate. Oh, Krakus, that's the Polish brand. Yeah, exactly. Um, sure, give it a try. Yeah, so it so, sounds like... And um, report back to me. Yeah, it sounds like Bellini has uh, rooms for experimentation. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you know, um, if you think about the hardship of many people's lives historically in Russia without access to uh, a right. lot of different products, they would constantly be using what is at hand. And one of the things that I found so impressive in uh, researching this book was just the ingenuity of the Russians who would take some ingredient that we think of as almost expendable and not very interesting and do something to it that brings out its essential flavors and turns it absolutely delicious. I mean, I'm thinking primarily of, of um, the whole history of their cultured dairy and all of their fermented vegetables. And so it's a heightening, it's always a heightening of the intrinsic flavor of the raw ingredient. So yeah, Absolutely. go for the crocus borscht and <laughs> see what happens. Yeah, I would say, uh, please, let it, please let us know how it goes. <laughs> um, so we're getting to the end here, but we have a question that goes beyond Blini. Uh, Susan is saying that she, uh, she did receive your cookbook as part of a, as a gift for being a judge for the Good Food Awards. And she loves it. She says it's gorgeous. But going through that cookbook, uh, she says she loves dumplings. And she would love to know your favorite dumpling to make or any tips on dumplings you may have. Oh, no. I always hate when I'm asked my favorite. It's, like, <laughs> it's hard to choose. <laughs> right. It's hard to choose. And it also depends on my mood. Mm. Uh, if I had to answer of the Russian dumplings, so I have three different, oh no, I think in this book, I might only have two different dumplings um, because the Vareniki, I was going to mention those are actually Ukrainian, so I didn't include those. So I have the Pinmini, which are the um, beloved and ubiquitous Russian dumplings that originally came from Siberia. And they look like uh, tortellini um, mm. a little bit. And they are filled with ground pork, or you can fill them with lamb um, and onion and herbs. And you can uh, serve them in chicken soup, or you can serve them plain, slathered with lots of sour cream and butter. <laughs> it's a light motif <laughs> here. Or you can do it in the Siberian way where you drizzle it with now I really am salivating. Of course, it's my dinner time here on the East Coast, but um, you can drizzle it with vinegar and hot mustard. So Ooh. I would say that those um, pilbini would be my favorite, but I discovered a, a old, I mean, like 
really old recipe that has mostly been lost today for uh, dumplings called kunzu mi, mm. which are really interesting because they're stuffed with um, buckwheat and uh, bitter greens and a little bit huh. of, often with a little bit of egg. So they're vegetarian. But what's astonishing about them is you kind of parboil them and you um, make them into um, sort of half moon shapes as opposed to more the pilmini shape, uh, pilmini, tortellini shape. And then you bake them in the oven. Right. And they're wow, really, so really, yeah, the texture is unlike any dumpling I've ever had. And uh, you serve them with a wild mushroom sauce and they're very intensely flavored. Wow. They're pretty awesome. <laughs> That sounds like nothing I've heard of before. It sounds so delicious. Yeah, I had never heard of it either. Uh, JR was wanting to repeat that name of that old dumpling that you just found. Oh, Kun Zhu Mui. Okay. You cannot uh, find it in the dictionary, but you'll find the recipe in the in Beyond the North Wind. Oh, oh there it is, JR. So you find you, not only will you find the name, but you'll find the recipe form in the cookbook Beyond the North Wind. That's wonderful. Uh, we are we are at the hour, so I really appreciate all the time, Dara, that you that you stayed and answered these questions. I know I am inspired to uh, make some blini and maybe even some pelmini this weekend and have a Russian feast. Um, I'm definitely going to uh, be a buyer of that cookbook. It looks absolutely beautiful, and I do love a cookbook with a bit of heft to it. It looks like <laughs> that is this. Are you saw me struggling yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah, it looks so gorgeous. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, thank you to 10 Speed Press and Clark and, Clark and Potter. Thank you so much for joining. Dara, Dara, thank you again. And congratulations again on your Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun.